Good morning, everybody. It is my distinct honor to introduce the talented Dr. Sobowale this morning. Dr. Kumi Sobowale obtained his BA in Psychology and Behavioral Neuroscience from Yale, his MD from the University of Chicago, and returned back to Yale to complete his residency in adult psychiatry. We recruited him hard to UCLA as a research track fellow for Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship, where he was selected as a prestigious RITFO fellow. During his fellowship training, he has received numerous competitive grants from the Sorensen Foundation, the Friends of Semmel, the Thrasher Research Fund, and ACAP. His research interests lie in the prevention and early intervention of mental illness in the perinatal period and early childhood. His current research leverages digital health technologies, including mobile devices and electronic health records data to examine determinants of perinatal depression and the mechanisms by which perinatal depression affects a caregiver-child interaction in child developmental outcomes. We are thrilled to have Dr. Sobawale present to us today on the topic of examining effects of postpartum depressive symptoms on parent-child interaction and development using sound. Please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A throughout the presentation and Dr. Sobawale will address them at the end of his talk. Welcome. All right, good morning everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to kind of take you through a, a journey that's gonna focus on how the perinatal depression affects the mother-child interaction and in turn, how that interaction uh, affects child development. And uh, during this presentation, I'm, I'm going to first do some background just on um, perineal depression and its effect on child development. And then um, I'm going to dive into some of the background on kind of uh, the parent-child interaction and using markers, audio markers, audio signals as markers of that parent-child interaction and then um, jump into some research findings related to this and then end off with some future directions and kind of current research. So um, there are uh, some questions, uh, Q&A questions that um, everyone can just take uh, a minute to do. And, and through the presentation, um, those questions will be answered. And at the end of this presentation, there'll be a question um, and an I'll answer a question. So um, if questions come up, you can put them in, in the Q&A chat. So I I'll give folks uh, just a little bit to answer some of these um, questions. All right, and um, so the, the poll answers are up. And I'm just going to put them here so everyone can see. Um, so folks had um, thoughts about how perineal depression affects uh, child development. Uh, when can infants begin to hear? A lot of people thought second trimester. Um, and about half, a little bit more than half have um, heard of conversational turn taken or surf and return. And um, only about a third have heard of uh, infant directed speech or, or mother ease. So we're going to dive into that in this in this talk. All right, so I want to first start off with um, postpartum depression. So postpartum depression is defined um, similar to regular depression as five or more uh, depressive symptoms uh, over the course of two weeks. Um, however, for postpartum depression, it occurs between the time period in most definitions from birth to the first year postpartum. And in the United States, 13% of women uh, annually, that's at least 500,000 women, um, are, are diagnosed with postpartum depression. And when you look at studies where they have lower clinical cutoffs, so folks that don't meet clinical criteria but still have significant depressive symptoms, it can still have the same effect on, on the mother's uh, day-to-day -day functioning. And, and part of the reason why we're interested in postpartum depression is not only its effect on the mother uh, themselves, but also on the child and the family um, um, system. 
And I, I want to say something from the get-go, which is a lot of this work in this field has focused on mothers, and that can seem like mother blaming. However, um, a lot of uh, associations with child developmental outcomes have been sh have shown that um, postpartum depression in moms, as opposed to other caregivers, seems to have the most effect on their child, and that's partially why um, that's been a focus. And and there are many reasons why people think their postpartum depression exists. There's theories about hormones. There's theories about evolution, immune systems, and you know all of these things may be valid. There's a lot of heterogeneity within postpartum depression as a diagnosis. The same way there are many ways to get to the diagnosis of depression. Um, and I'm going to circle back to these theories, but it's important to know that, you know, regardless of the potential reasons, um, that it's been shown time and time again, that maternal postpartum depression can have negative effects on child development. And, uh, you know, people, most people said, um, that you see in the poll that you see effects on different parts of child development and that's correct. So you see, uh, increased um, cog or delayed cognitive development, uh, worth physical health, um, increased risk of mental health. You also see increased risk of injury and, and mortality in infants um, of mothers with postpartum depression. Um, there was uh, a, a meta-analysis that came out, I believe in, in 2021, early 2021, that looked at uh, 191 studies of children zero to from birth to 18, and um, looked at various child outcomes in the context of postpartum depression up to a year postpartum, and, and found um, effects across different areas of development as well as increased risk for physical health and mental health um, outcomes. And that included uh, a, nearly 200,000 kids in that meta analysis. And one question is. Is, is why um, is there this increased risk of um, adverse outcomes in the child? Uh, there are many different theories and um, uh, of why, but a lot is focused on, on, on parenting and, and caregiving quality. Um, this um, 2014 Lancet study goes into a, a lot of detail, but um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the parent-child interaction. So, you know, we often think about this as a communication between um, the caregiver um, and, and the child. This can be um, through um, conversation, verbal cues, this can be through nonverbal cues. Um, but what you, you tend to see in depression is um, you can find that because of poor sleep, uh, anhedonia, um, lower energy, there may be less of a, a mother-child bond, the mother's feelings toward the child. There be, may be less responsiveness, how quickly they respond to the child. In some cases, there can be irritability. Um, and so in day-to-day -day interactions, it's possible that depression can affect the, um, um, the connection between the mother and child. And, and that may have cascading effects on development because the infant brain is developing quite rapidly um, within the first few years of life. And one of the reasons why it's really important to understand this interaction is because a lot of our current interventions um, for postpartum depression um, do not address um, this interaction. And studies where they have tried to address it, you ha we haven't seen as much effect on child outcomes. So even though interpersonal psychotherapy and CBT can decrease depressive symptoms by 50% in women with postpartum de depression, and they're really effective. Um, they seem to have limited effects on that parent-child interaction. Um, they also have limited effects on child outcomes. And there's been studies that try to augment um, existing um, postpartum depression interventions with kind of parenting interventions um, but they haven't panned out. In those studies, for example, in, um, you see that uh, there can be short-term effects on 
that seem to be beneficial for the child, but um, they kind of wash out in the long term. And so having a better understanding of the parent-child interaction may be one way to uh, develop new interventions that are more tailored to aspects of this interaction that may be uh, awry uh, in the context of postpartum depression. And in the literature, one kind of consistent findings, you find that parents who are more sensitive um, tend to, uh, their children tend to have um, positive outcomes in terms of uh, development, uh, cognitive language, and also um, in uh, social emotional development uh, and decreased risk of psycho future psychopathology. Um, however, sensitivity um, can be uh, defined in many ways. One meta-analysis um, defines it as a caregiver's emotional and behavioral responses to the child that shows that they're uh, in sync with the child and that they understand the child's uh, current uh, emotional state. Um, and, and I like that because you have to both perceive how the child is doing and, and respond appropriately. However, um, even though there, you can take that definition, it can be measured in a lot of different ways. And often how folks are measuring sensitivity is through observation. Um, and, and this can be in, through different settings. And, and there are generally two categories of, of observations where they observe the parent-child interaction. Um, there's a um, macro analysis, which is um, kind of looking at the parent-child interact and kind of getting a, a gestalt um, of what is the quality of this this interaction. You can also look at things at a more granular level, which is called microanalysis, moment by moment. What's happening is, uh, for example, uh, what is the affect of the caregiver? Are they looking happy? Are they looking irritated? Are they looking um, um, anxious? Or how often are they speaking with the child and vice versa? How often is a child speaking with them? Because it can be, it's a bidirectional interaction. And I wanted to um, give you a chance to see what it's like to do microanalysis. So I'm gonna put up a, a video and have you guys just um, rate whether the caregiver does these things or not. So um, take a quick look at these things and, and I'm gonna throw up a video in a second and just have you, have you rate it. All right, so this is from um, a few items from one scale that uh, one uh, uh, microanalysis assessment. All right, I'm gonna put up the video and have you guys do the rating. You need help? Try again. Oh, you're so strong, you're so strong. Okay, let's see if we can lift it up. There we go. Can you try again? There you go, you got the lid off. All right, so. Okay, so hopefully you were able to um, get a feel for, for what that was like. Um, and so something like that would occur in, in a lab setting or in the home. And if it was on a more granular level, if you're doing that moment by moment, saying what is happening uh, in this frame, that would be uh, microanalysis. However, uh, I hope this gives you a sense that, um, uh, of what it looks like. However, when you look at different observational assessments, uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity in how people actually characterize that interaction. So the, the items that people use to, to rate vary a lot, um, which can, can lead to issues. Um, there's also um, some of these measures can be proprietary, which makes it hard for um, uh, researchers to access, and that sometimes leads to some of these disparities in, in uh, which measures people use. Um, as I was saying, if you're doing moment by moment coding of affect or when the mom speaks, that can be a very burdensome task. It can take several hours to code even 
uh, videos that are uh, a few minutes long. Or uh, so um, that can be onerous. Um, and then because either families are coming to the lab as uh, with this uh, mother child or um, um, experimenters are going to the home, sometimes the mother or child may not uh, act totally like they would normally because they feel uncomfortable. They may be in an unfamiliar setting and whatnot. And there also may be kind of social desirability effects. And so that can uh, contribute to maybe not capturing uh, this interaction as it would naturally occur. And then there are logistical barriers. We can think of difficulty getting to the lab, going to the home. You know, this is all compounded by COVID now, setting up equipment to videotape and whatnot. And so because of some of these challenges, um, it can lead to small samples in these studies and, and less diverse samples. Um, there are advantages of for example, come into a lab and having a structured uh, experiment, but it may not capture um, aspects of kind of a naturalistic interaction. And so what I think we need is, is new tools and um, to both help us capture this interaction and also to help us ideally uh, process the information in a way that wouldn't be so burdensome. And then um, once we capture this interaction, we can, you know, either use theory or data-driven processes like uh, machine learning to test out different hypotheses and on how this interaction affects um, child outcomes. And how I, one way to pro I propose that we could do this is through um, uh, digital phenotyping. Ideally, you'd want something that's not intrusive that can catch capture a naturalistic interaction in a way that would be more automated so that this process would be um, a lot faster and you can capture more people. And um, you know, digital phenotyping is just a term that talks about how you can capture kind of people's day-to-day -day world and experience using sensors. So the phone does that. For many of us, we have apps or whatnot that uh, we use for tracking. Um, but, um, you know, for the purposes of the parent-child interaction, some of the things that capturing um, this interaction over the course of a long period of time using sensors could offer is more reliability in terms of um, the data that's captured. And that's important for um, between person differences. And also it's interesting even to look within kind of dyad um, progression over time. Um, it can help capture things in a naturalistic setting if you're using these sensors um, at home or um, as they go about their day to day. Um, it also um, does it in a way that's reproducible. Sometimes when it's a human coding, there can be bias that comes in. Um, people may not be as well trained and that can be a limitation. Um, and once the data is captured, uh, you know, ideally we can use it to test new hypotheses in the future. Um, and I want to focus on the use of um, audio and, and audio signals. And um, this was one of the questions. So um, children begin to, to hear um, sounds in the, in the third trimester. And um, one of the, the, the reasons why I, I'm focusing on audio is um, developmentally, um, it's important. So once newborns are born, uh, shortly after they recognize the, the voice of their mother, that's pretty, pretty astounding, um, and, and they're drawn to it. Um, evolutionarily, there are reasons as well um, that, uh, for example, in back in the day, when um, women uh, in hunter-gathering societies are often doing foraging, get, going out for food. Um, the, the child may uh, be placed down and, and using audio has advantages. One, um, whether the child is crying or making other vocalizations, um, it's a way for them to, to capture their parent's attention and their parent can respond in a way that they know they're there, even if they're out of sight. So with vision, you know that you have to see the person 
But with audio, you can potentially um, hear them even if they're they're out of sight, um, and and that can help potentially regulate the child who is pretty helpless uh, in early life to have that reassurance, to have that rewarding signal from caregivers or extended networks. Um, and then just practically, um, when I looked through different measures of the parent-child interaction and looked at the specific items of uh, measures that had strong psychometric properties, um, I found that capturing things like the quality of um, the mom voice or how responsive the mom was could be best captured using audio and also afford some more privacy than things like videotaping. And, and so that's how we settled um, on it. I'm gonna talk about three constructs today um, that um, three audio signals that capture the, the mother-child interaction. The first one I'm gonna talk about is um, turn-taking. And, and just so you know what that is, um, we can uh, we have two speakers here. The infant says wa, and the caregiver says what's that? And then the infant says wa wa, and then the caregiver says oh you want water? All right. Uh, and this would be example of um, three turns. So a turn we just consider when you go from one speaker to another speaker. So infant to mother, uh, or caregiver caregiver to the infant, and infant back to caregiver. So three. It doesn't count as a turn when the same speaker. Um, just speaks different utterances, has to go back and forth. Um, and it's actually a pretty amazing thing on turn taking. Um, you have to perceive the person speaking to you like when they're going to end. And then often, like even before they're ending, you're starting to say what you're going to say. And this back and forth turn taking, um, this. Uh, occurs quite quickly. And even within the first few months of life, you see it between caregivers uh, and, and, and infants. Um, you know, they're not speaking words, but, you know, they're making vocalizations and it, this intricate dance begins quite early in life. Um, and, and one way I like to think about it is, you know, that was kind of a very 2D representation I like to think about it as spirals of communication. So the mother or the caregiver speaks, the child speaks, uh, and it goes back and forth and back and forth. And, and that's rewarding for the infant. Because again, they, they're very helpless. They may be feeling different things in their body. They may be feeling physiologically unwell because uh, they're getting used to a new world. They need to use the bathroom, so forth and so on. And so having that... Um, response tends to be regulating for the child and and rewarding for the child and the caregiver and and so they can kind of the spiral of communication can kind of go on and on and it's it's important to think about what could happen when one's depressed and I, i'm coming back to these theories here um so one of the theories uh why postpartum depression forms is Take kind of an evolutionary approach. It basically says that um, postpartum depression is uh, a signal to the father of a child and, and other um, folks in other kin that the mother needs more support taking care of his child because the mom still needs to take care of herself. And uh, often there's a uh, responsibility that is um, expected to help take care of the child. And this kind of um, balance, this trade-off, if you will, between taking care of yourself and, and another human can be um, draining. And, and, and one way I conceptualize it, um, how this can affect the parent-child interaction in this case, conversational turn-taking is that maternal depression um, leads to decreased energy, anhedonia fatigue. That makes folks less likely to engage in conversational turn-taking with the child. And conversational turn-taking has been shown, I should say, to be important both for um, cognitive and language development and um, has been suggested to be important for things like executive function. Um, and, and because there's less energy here, this um, leads to less conversational turn-taking 
and that may predispose um, a child to developmental um, risk or uh, risk of future psychopathology. Of course, this is probabilistic, it's not deterministic, but um, this is the model I'm working with. So this could be, you know, if a child is not getting that response, you could imagine they would speak more. They may say, wah, and wait for a response and say, wah, wah, and wah, wah. So you can see the child kind of trying to get a response, but what you find over time um, with um, studies of depression is that um, over time, the infant actually starts to vocalize less with that um, caregiver. Um, and so if we think about this kind of spiral of communication, let's say your mom is, uh, or your caregiver is at the top door there and you live in a, in a lower apartment, that the child takes a step to try to get a response. Um, they don't get a response. They take another step and try to get a response. Over time, they're gonna say, oh, they may pick their head out the window, but they're gonna learn that um, this response is, is, is not coming. And so there's been um, quite um, a, a lot of work showing that um, um, depression can, can lead to, to less uh, turn-taking in, in mothers um, primarily. And that's where the study's been done. And I wanna give you a sense of just what turn-taking sounds like um, because we're doing, um, uh, this is um, potentially public. I'm just gonna play sounds. This first um, uh, dyad is just gonna be one that doesn't have a lot of conversational turn taking and the second one is. Here I put just kind of like a, a droning sound for whenever there isn't a turn. Um, whenever a mom leads a turn, it's gonna be a piano key. And then whenever a child leads a turn, it's gonna be a xylophone. So uh, I'm gonna play this um, first one where there's not so much conversational turn taking. Oh, let me go back a little bit. There we go. Now this drones is what kind of sound is when there isn't um, a turn being taken. How it is taking a turn? All right, here's uh, the second, um, here's the second um, dyad where there's more conversation with her dick. Again, the piano is the mom, the telephone is the child. All right. Um, it's beautiful when you have nice interaction like that. Um, I want to give you a sense of what this looks like uh, just in terms of um, uh, live so you can uh, get a sense. So um, you may have seen this video, but this is a great example of conversational turn taking. Yes, okay. Did you understand it though? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, no. Not, not this one. This is, this is the grand finale of this. Okay. Yeah, that's the last one. That's what I was wondering. I don't know what they're going to do next season because they did some stuff this time. Exactly what I was thinking. Oh, yeah. 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 Right, don't bring that in. You know what I'm saying? Don't do the same stuff. You know what I'm saying? All right, 
think you you get the idea. So that's just an example of conversational turn taking. So um, to kind of probe um, uh, if the press of symptoms affect conversational turn taking, I used um, I took a secondary data analysis approach, um, and the um, cohort that we use is called a Healthy Babies Before Birth Study. And this basically followed mothers through early pregnancy all the way to one year postpartum. Uh, it uh, consisted of mothers in uh, Denver, Colorado, and in the, and Los Angeles. And these were mothers recruited um, without much um, exclusion criteria. They couldn't have had uh, active substance use. Um, they couldn't have had certain active infectious diseases or but otherwise, it wasn't necessarily recruited in terms of trying to get a depressed or particularly anxious sample. And um, I was particularly interested in this data set um, because uh, it has uh, parent-child interaction that was captured in the lab setting um, at around six months postpartum, um, as well as um, depressive symptoms that was captured uh, at this time point as well. And then at 12 months postpartum, there was a developmental assessment done. And I was interested in whether to, in um, a few questions. Um, first, getting back to kind of that um, new tools piece, I was interested in whether um, we could use a, an algorithm to detect when um, speech was occurring and, and also detect who was speaking whether it was the mother or child, again, to get back to trying to um, help automate and make this kind of pre-processing uh, a little bit easier. So just to give you a sense on the experiment itself, you're probably familiar with the still face. You may be familiar with the still face paradigm, but essentially um, it's a lab-based um, kind of stressful inter interaction that occurs and it has, essentially two, or I should say three stages. It has a kind of beginning play stage where the mother and child interact, uh, play for usually around two minutes. And then um, a still face stage where the mother or the caregiver, I should say, puts on kind of a, a blank stonewalled face and doesn't interact with the child. This usually leads the child to, to get upset. And then um, what's called a reunion phase after that, when uh, the caregiver and child can inter in interact again and kind of seeing how that interaction goes. Uh, you know, depending on the paradigm, some of these stages may be repeated, but for this particular study, I just focused on, on these three stages over about each stage is two minutes, so six minutes total. And just to give you a sense of the sample, so um, this study enrolled and followed 233 women. Um, 83 of them had um, that uh, video, in-person video. And among those, there are some where it was stopped early or kind of one stage was curtailed. So I excluded some of those and that left an analytic sample of 62 um, dyads. And again, this is turn-taking, moving from one speaker to another. And what we did with this algorithm, this open source algorithm was um, give it just the audio from these video interactions and, and had it first detect um, if there's um, any speech at all. This, um, so is there is there sound here? Is there a voice here? Um, second was to kind of uh, say like, okay, there are different voices here. Can you separate these different voices, this classification? And then, you know, one kind of main focus here was, can you say who this speaker is? And for this algorithm, it just says, um, if it's a male, a child, or, or female, but, you know, depending on the algorithm, it may say it's something like a TV. Um, and then, you know, you can take things one step further and say, um, what, what, what kind of vocalization is this? But I'm gonna focus mainly on the um, diarizationization part today. So um, to do this, we, we had 
the algorithm code who was speaking. And then we had uh, humans code uh, who was speaking and wanted to see how accurate the algorithm was. And so these are metrics that tend to be used in um, the language and speech field, but they're similar to things we know. Recall is, pretty, is similar to sensitivity. It's basically what percentage of, um, among all the times that a certain speaker speaks, what percentage is identified by the algorithm? Um, so that's the recall. And the position is kind of like the positive predictive value. What percentage of um, things identified as algorithm as a certain speaker is actually that speaker? Um, and so that's kind of, um, um, you can kind of use this table here to, to think about that. But um, the Lena, which is kind of a, a, a open, I shouldn't say, is kind of is a gold standard um, audio recorder that people use to uh, audio co audio record um, interactions in the home environment. These are the stats for it. It's it's recalled about sixty percent and its precision is about uh, sixty eight percent. So what did we find? Um, so um, what we found is for the child, the algorithm identified. Uh, about 26% of the times a child was actually speaking compared to how many times it was actually speaking. Uh, and uh, the for the mother, um, it was about 24% uh, that the algorithm identified all the times that the mom was speaking, uh, from which the algorithm identified that the mom was speaking. Then when you look at the position, um, among the, the vocalizations identified by the algorithm as a child, uh, about 32% were actually the child and, and similar for, for the mother. Um, so, so definitely less than the Lena, um, probably not great, but I do want to put into context that the way we did this was continuous coding. So the algorithm, some, often when they do um, compare algorithm to human, they will take segments of a video. So they'll say maybe two, um, two second segments and is who's speaking here, if anyone. And um, they'll have a human do that and they'll give the same two second segment to the algorithm. Uh, and they'll usually do this at random parts um, of uh, interaction. However, here we just um, did it continuously. We didn't say like, um, take this section and then determine. So. Um, even though it's it's less accurate, it's overall it's um, not terrible. It's just we use a stricter criteria. All right, and now the the two questions about um, depressive symptoms and its association with conversational turn taking at six months, and then also conversational turn taking's association with child development at twelve months. This is our sample um, pretty ethnically diverse? Not as much racially. Most folks live with their partner. Moms are, were well-educated. Most infants were born term, about 50%, 50 50 in terms of infant sex, and at uh, around 12 months postpartum, about 50% or 51% were breastfeeding. In terms of outcomes, we focus on cognitive and language development using the Bailey. This is um, assessment that's done by um, trained raters. So the child will come in and they will do certain tasks with the child and with their caregiver there and see how well their child performs. Um, we uh, unfortunately didn't have the social emotional um, scores that would have been really lovely to have. So we're focusing primarily on uh, cognition and language here. And um, just in terms of um, the, this sample, the cognition and uh, language were within norms. These are um, standardized, so they're 100 um, the average. So they were within norms. The presence symptoms were pretty low uh, on the PHQ-9, as you can see here. Um, there was about seven turns per minute uh, in this sample. And the ratio that, that's listed here of kind of, uh, of mom to infant turns was about 1.0. So it's but equal in times um, the mom would initiate the turn versus the child. 
And here's a correlation table here. Um, um, the only things that were significant were receptive language and expressive language with com language composite, which makes sense because the language composite is composed of receptive and expressive language, but nothing else was associated in terms of um, these um, variables of interest. In terms of the regression, um, depressive symptoms was not associated with turn-taking. Um, not surprisingly, infant vocalization, how many times infant speaks per minute was associated with number of turns taken per minute um, and, and also number of children. But um, if you take out infant vocalization, that um, was no longer significant. Um, and I just highlight um, language here too, um, because it was the only other kind of significant finding. Um, again, um, in terms of turn taking, predicting um, child development outcomes, it did not. Um, and uh, only breastfeeding was, more breastfeeding was associated with more expressive language and more compositive language, which was probably driven by um, expressive language. So just in summary, um, there was frequent turn taken in this sample and it was bi-directional in terms of who led turns, mother or child. There was no association with depressive symptoms and turn taking, and there was no association between turn taking and cognition and language development in the child um, later on. And uh, I'll get to the end some limitations with uh, this sample, but for time being, I'm going to move on to the next construct, which is child directed speech or infant directed speech, other known as otherwise known as motherese, and about half of folks uh, knew this. So. Basically, this is kind of the way that um, most people interact with young children, particularly caregivers. They speak in um, a slower tempo. They use simpler words. The pitch of their voice tends to be higher and it tends to be more variable. And that's illustrated here in this um, cross-cultural um, study that compared how adults talk to, to young children verse um, to other adults. And so this was done in 21 um, sites in six continents um, and different societies. So some that are hunter-gatherers, some that are agriculture, some that are urban. And basically what you can see is um, there's some features that uh, distinguish infant-directed speech from speech that adults speak to each other. Again, it has a higher pitch. And there's more variability, and you see that um, cross cross site. So, um, just to give you a sense of infant directed speech, I'm going to show a video, and and it's important to say that infant directed speech is something that you see in non-human primates. You see it in um, certain songbirds, and it's thought to help with uh, drawing attention of the child and that can facilitate learning, and it can also potentially help um, regulate the child uh, in terms of um, distress. There's some evolutionary thought behind that, particularly as, again, if um, uh, a child was put down while uh, a caregiver was foraging, um, by having a higher pitch of voice suggests that um, whoever is approaching is likely a small animal, uh, as opposed to some type of predator, which is gonna be growling. And so um, that was thought to potentially be one reason why this developed. So um, just to give you a sense of if it directed speech or motherese or caregiverese. Hi, Archie. Hi, you gonna smile? Oh, look, you're so cute. You hear that it's high pitch. Yeah. You took a Mode, nap, huh? Tempo. Was it a good nap? Simple word. Yeah. Also changes. That's well. a good point. Um, and this is a classic study from University of Washington that shows that infants tend to prefer this speech compared to adult-directed speech. I think the experiment begins. Now the baby can They're turn on either motherese or adult-directed speech by turning his head either to the right or left. Each head turn produces an eight-second sample of speech. Sweet baby. Yes, you are. And you're getting so big. Mm -hmm. This infant's behavior is typical. 
He looks back and forth, sampling the speech presented on each side, and does not yet show signs of a preference. Hey, you. Hey, you. What you looking at? After about eight trials, a preference for motherese begins to emerge. All right. So, um, yeah, that class experiment just shows that um, infants tend to prefer um, this high pitched, um, pitch variable um, form of interaction. I'm not going to focus as much on singing today, um, but to say that um, infant directed singing is also a thing. It's such a um, lead to cohesion when infants interact with uh, a stranger, they're more likely to approach a strange adult who's a stranger if they're singing, particularly they're singing a familiar song. It's sought evolutionarily to signal in-group versus out-group. And there's been several studies that show that singing um, can help regulate a child um, who's distressed, um, both in terms of things like lullabies, which tend to be more kind of uh, down regulating and, and play songs can um, that are more kind of up tempo can also regulate in a different way. Um, and in depression, you see less pitch range, so less modulation of um, the caregiver's voice. Um, and with singing, it's, it's relatively unknown. There, there's not really studies in this area. So again, taking that model, we can think that depression leads to uh, material depression leads to decreased energy fatigue, um, and that leads to less uh, infant-directed speech. Infant-directed speech takes more energy to produce than just talking to a normal adult, like I'm talking to you all, and perhaps um, that leads to increased risk of um, child developmental difficulties or mental health uh, issues in the future. So uh, same study sample here. Um, uh, because we're, we didn't need the whole interaction, we just needed samples of the mom's voice. We had a, a, a larger sample size here, 75. And, and these are the questions here. Are depressive symptoms associated with pitch, pitch characteristics of the mother-child interaction at six months postpartum? And are in turn at six, this interaction at six months, the pitch metrics, are they associated with um, child development at 12 months postpartum? Just to give you a sense of these pitch metrics, um, we can think about within utterance. The utterance is basically just how much I say you can say in a single breath. So, hello, that's an utterance. Um, that was just another utterance. I say in a single breath. Uh, and we can think about how pitch varies within utterances and between utterances. So, hmm, it's a pretty, not a lot of pitch change there compared to wow, that has a lot of pitch change within a single utterance. And then we can think about a cross utterance. So, hmm, that's amazing. Not a lot of variability there in terms of pitch or wow, that is amazing. So there's that um, change in pitch across utterances. Um, and, you know, one way to think about, um, and one way to think about this is kind of with the, between utterances is, we can think about the flow of a conversation. Over the course of conversation, how is pitch changing? So for example, um, we can have a word that has uh, within that single utterance, a single utterance like wow, that has a lot of pitch change, but a whole conversation is just wow, wow, wow. Across the, um, the conversation, that would be pretty, um, there wouldn't be a lot of variability there. The same way of hmm, hmm, hmm. So, Anyway, so this is kind of how it's operationalized here. Um, the with an utterance metrics were kind of the, the mean pitch, um, the the range within a, within a utterance in terms of pitch, and also um, the standard deviation. And then um, cross utterance, we took um, kind of progressively when it, one moves from one utterance to the next utterance. You said what is um, the, the um, difference in terms of mean pitch between sub subsequent utterances, and then took the, uh, or sorry, what is the difference in the mean between utterances? And then we took um, the mean across all the utterances in the conversation. So um, that gives a flavor of 
is there a lot of variability within the conversation or not? And then kind of um, some other measures of variability is just over all the utterances in a conversation, what was the range of the pitch and the standard deviation? Um, we had the same outcomes in terms of developmental outcomes for cognition and language at 12 months postpartum. And um, the sample was similar in terms of uh, demographics as I mentioned before, and the developmental outcomes were within uh, standard norms. Within um, these 75 dyads, there was, or I should say mothers, uh, there was 2,040 utterances times that the mother spoke. And I just focused on the playtime uh, in the initial still phase, um, uh, as is often done in, in other studies, as opposed to focusing on the reunion phase or whatnot. Um, there are a lot of pitch metrics here. Um, I would just highlight the, the mean pitch of the mom voice was kind of within um, what you find with other studies. Uh, these other metrics are not as important in terms of their values. So the first question is depressive symptoms associated with mother-child interaction at six months postpartum. Uh, and again, we have the within utterance um, that we're um, focusing on here. And what we found for the pitch mean, we used a multi-level model here. And basically what you see is essentially the effect of depressive symptoms was practically uh, zero in terms of how it affected within utterance um, um, pitch. And then the pitch range within utterance we found the same thing. Um, the variance accounted for by depressive symptoms was um, practically zero and the, and the confidence intervals show that with pretty good certainty here. Uh, and then we can think about cross utterance um, between utterances. Was there a difference between folks who had um, elevated depressive um, symptoms? This is just a, a violin plot. Um, you can see that the groups that had elevated depression risks didn't necessarily have, um, don't look that different from um, the group that wasn't at risk. And this is the t-test that um, looks at kind of the cutoff the PHQ-9. There are only three people who were depressed here. And while you see that there was less utterance to utterance variability, um, it, it wasn't significant. Uh, in terms of how these pitch metrics um, associate with uh, child development, um, we looked at the cross utterance metrics um, here. And basically what you find um, if you focus on these three different metrics of um, cross utterance, um, these three different pitch metric cross utterance variables and developmental outcomes is the associations were weak um, and, and, and not significant. Uh, we did find that mothers who um, sang, uh, mothers with, uh, who sang versus didn't sang during the interaction um, were less likely to be depressed. So um, mothers who sang were less likely to be depressed um, during interaction. So in summary, there's no association between the pitch metrics and depression. Mothers with uh, more depressive symptoms uh, sang less, but there was no association between, and there was no association between pitch metrics and cognitive and language development. Uh, just, I wanted to highlight some limitations. I know these, with these null findings, there were, this was a sample where there was very minimal folks who actually had significant depressive symptoms. Um, there was, because this is a one-shot interaction in the lab, um, we captured only a small part of the, the mother-child interaction over the course of a few minutes. So it may not be representative of how they act over a longer period of time or naturalistically. We used the still face in part because we wanted to see um, if there'd be, um, when the mother was stressed, there'd be more of, potentially you would see uh, more variability in terms of their affect, and that may be reflected in their uh, conversational turns or their, or their pitch. Um, but a lot of studies use free play, which may have been a better paradigm to use. 
And then also just in terms of developmental outcomes, things like language development or cognition um, can develop uh, more solidly later as children are developing. For example, language often kicks up in a, starting from around 18 months. And so we might have been a little bit too early in some of these developmental outcomes. So next steps, we're doing a longitudinal um, study using wearables to try to capture the uh, mother-child interaction in the context of postpartum depression. Uh, and we're also applying kind of new hypothesis. And again, this gets back to this idea of using new tools. Um, so ideally you wanna capture um, more longer and more naturalistic inputs and, um, and also think about more ways to um, think about how we um, analyze these, these outcomes. And I, I'm gonna wrap up in a minute after I just kind of tell you about this study. So essentially we think that decreased care given quality leads to developmental and mental health difficulties in children and depression um, leads to decreased what we're operationalizing as decreased caregiving quality here is decreased pitch range and turn taking, which I've discussed. And we're again, interested in how depressive symptoms affect um, audio, these kind of audio characteristics of the parent-child interaction and how these characteristics are associated with um, child social, emotional and behavioral problems in 12 months. Um, and so we're um, aiming to have 170 dyads 85 for high risk for depression and 85 low risk uh, captures him, um, I should say 34 uh, towards the end of pregnancy. And we're gonna um, have them wear um, these um, sensors um, during weekends, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, over the course of, of uh, um, three days and um, capture um, audio for 10 hours each day. So it's gonna be, or wear these sensors for at least 10 hours each day. And we'll get kind of the audio recording. We'll also get a sense of proximity using Bluetooth beacons. And then um, mother's activity, sleep, and heart rate variability, which is kind of um, a proxy for stress using a Fitbit. And so either just the sensors we're using, and we're gonna follow um, these dyads six weeks postpartum, then every three months after, um, with our main outcome being child behavioral and emotional problems at, at six months. And, you know, a lot of what I spoke about in terms of how these interactions are analyzed is measures of central tendency, mean, medium, that kind of thing, um, or just quantities. Uh, but we also think of how these interactions are distributed. And I'm particularly interested in kind of what are the patterns over the course of, of the day in terms of these interaction and can that be a different way to analyze this type of data? So um, to conclude, you know, for future steps, um, you know, we're hoping to capture more naturalistic assessment that by using these um, low cost sensors um, in the home setting that we can get bigger samples and this can inform um, aspects of the mother-child interaction that can be modifiable for intervention, allowing for a scalable ideal diagnostic and therapeutic approaches. I'm particularly interested in kind of vocal approaches that work on pitch or um, conversational turn-taking. So with that, a lot of people, mentors, collaborators to thank, um, as well as um, grad students, undergrads, research assistants I've worked with, and uh, these are my funding resources. So. I'd uh, love to take any um, questions or, or hear your thoughts. So thank you for, for joining today. That was so helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Sobawale. Um, we have a few questions and maybe I will pose them to you right now. Um, such a great talk. And can you explain and talk a little bit more about how you will capture their interaction in the home environment. Sure. I know I kind of uh, breathe through at the end for time's sake, but but yeah, I mean, we're hoping that, um, that we use this audio sensor that doesn't actually record um, 
conversations. Every 30 seconds, it captures um, features of conversations such as the pitch, um, such as timber, um, and a lot of other audio features. And the mother wears one um, audio recorder, um, the child wears an audio recorder as well. And um, by using the Bluetooth sensors, we can tell who's in proximity of the child. And so that we give that, uh, so the mother child have one, also the any other significant caregiver um, has one. And so this allows us to get a sense of who's close to the child. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned, we use the, the, the Fitbit as well to kind of probe, are there times that are stressful for um, the mom? And how does interaction look in, in that setting? We also put a few Bluetooth sensors in the home to try to get kind of contextual data. For example, um, how is the interaction during times that may be stressful, like around the, the child's crib, where we may expect um, um, these interactions to look a little bit different. So interesting. Um, thank you. And, and maybe we have time for about two more questions. And I will ask another one now. How do you account for the role of other caregivers who are involved? Oh, yeah, that gets to what I was just saying. So um, we get a sense of how proximate they are to the child to give a sense of um, if they are interacting with, um, with the child, uh, which is can be a limitation of other studies where we don't have a good sense of who's actually interacting with the, with the child in the home environment. So that's that's kind of how we include them in this study. I thought I think someone else put their hand, someone put their hand up, maybe. Yeah, I think if we if we could have any questions um, from anybody who's raising their hand, you can enter it in the Q and A, and we'll be able to see it. Um, and maybe for kind of the second to last question is what would an intervention look like in this specific population? Your question. So um, I think um, there is research going that, um, and it's mostly, well, there's some observational, there's some interventional research, but um, there is observational research showing that um, conversational turn taking, for example, at six months was associated with child um, behavioral difficulties and, and, and mental health issues at 18 months. Um, post or 18 months of life. Um, and so one could imagine an intervention and these interventions really exist from kind of the language development and, and speech pathology field where they try to increase this kind of serve and return in terms of interactions. Yes. So this is done, some just focus on audio, some take like just a short video of interactions and uh, try to, um, get caregivers to increase their turn taking that way and it's been shown that when you coach families they're able to do this and it's that's actually been measured and so that would be one interaction uh, or one intervention to potentially adapt um, you can imagine something similar with um, pitch and you know ideally you want to be someplace where you can capture young folks so um, within the pediatric setting or uh, or whatnot so I think that's kind of one way. I mean, there are also potential singing interventions and there's some studies looking looking at that as well that are uh, coming out. I love that you brought up the serve and return. I feel like that's so powerful when you mention that, people are like, what is that? And then when you explain it and, and they can actually do it, you can see those neurons firing. Well, thank you so much. That was a wonderful grand rounds, Dr. Sobawale. And um, thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. And uh, if you want to shoot me an email or anything, you had questions, we're unable to ask. Always, always happy to chat. Um, take care.